Okay. So I guess we should start. Uh, so welcome everyone to the mathematical relativity parallel invited parallel session. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to organize this uh, parallel session. And of course, to the speakers for doing the actual work of presenting their work in this parallel session. The, the basic idea was just to give a glimpse of what is done in, in terms of mathematical relativity in Portugal and with a cherry on top with a very special guest. Uh, and so first we have José Natari, which is central figure in... Uh, oh, we didn't get the Mira Fernandes, uh, but that, that was annoying. So there's a lot of rooms. Every room has the name of a Portuguese mathematician. For instance, the Pedro Nunes room. And, and there's a Mira Fernandes room, which is not our room, unfortunately, because Mira Fernandes was, I guess, the first mathematical relativist in, in Portugal. So that was unfortunate, but uh, we have... Uh, but we're going to start with, with Zenatario, which is a central figure in mathematics, in mathematical relativity, around whose orbit the, the mathematical relativity group of Lisbon started. And he has worked on a lot of different fields in, inside of mathematical relativity. And today is going to speak about the decay of waves in expanding cosmology. So the Zoom is yours, Zé, and start. <laughs> okay, thank you. So let me share the screen. Uh, so can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, so today I'm speaking about this uh, sort of simple problem, but still interesting. Uh, so I'm going to discuss how the solutions to the wave equation decay when you have a cosmological space-time. Uh, so this is joint work with um, several people. So João Costa was here. Pedro Oliveira, who was our PhD student, and Flavio Rossetti, who is going to be our PhD student. Um, so as you probably all know, um, uh, a friedman lumetre robertson walker cosmological model uh, is given by a, a, a real, so a, a time interval in the, in the real line which I'm going to take to be from some t0 to plus infinity. And then you have a, a spatial section, which I'm going to take to be Rn. Uh, on this time interval, you fix uh, a function, a positive function called the scale, the scale factor. And I'm going to assume that this function is uh, non-decreasing. So maybe constant, maybe increasing. And this is the metric for the, for the friedman lumet robertson walker model, uh, which I'm going to say FLRW from now on. So it's so the, the it's just like Minkowski, except that the spatial part is multiplied by this by the scale factor, well, by its square actually. So this is a Lorentzian manifold, uh, and whoops, sorry. And on, on this Lorentzian manifold, we, we want to consider uh, this initial value problem. So it's the usual wave equation. So the uh, and then we have uh, initial conditions at some at the, the instant t0. So I give the value of phi and the value of the time derivative of phi at time t0. Uh, and I want to study the solutions to, to this problem. Um, so what can you do? Well, first of all, there's uh, something very important here, which is uh, the so-called conformal time. Uh, that's just the integral of uh, one over a of t. The reason why this is called the conformal time is that if you change coordinates to this variable, uh, then your spacetime metric becomes conformal to the Minkowski metric. So the, the scale factor goes outside, and here you have the Minkowski metric. Um, moreover, uh, the, the, the range of this conformal time tells you the nature of uh, of, of time like infinity, if you, if you would. So if, if the, the, the value of the conformal time when t goes to plus infinity, if it's finite, then uh, you have a, what's called a space-like scry. And so the, the, the idea is that your, your conformal time tau goes up to some constant value and not, no further, right? And so when you draw the Penrose diagram, there's a, there's a future boundary 
a space like future boundary. Uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's very easy to, 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 to understand that our wave function is not going to a constant as, as it does in, in Minkowski spacetime, uh, but rather it goes to, to a function defined on scry. So uh, an easy argument is the following. So take a Cauchy surface uh, and take here initial data for a constant solution. And here take initial data for another constant solution with a different value for the constant. Uh, glue the two initial data yeah, however you like, doesn't really matter. And so, of course, your solution will be constant on this shaded region and also on this other shaded region. And this means that uh, as you approach uh, future, future null infinity, uh, here your function will approach, will tend to some, well, actually it is constant. And here it will approach some other constant. And so if you, if you imagine doing this over and over, it's very easy to see that you can get whatever you like in scrap class. So this is an important point. Uh, to study the decay of the wave equation, uh, there are two important cases. Either you have a space-like scry or not, and the two are, are different. Um, so to, to study this problem, one thing that you can start doing is to, to consider Fourier modes. And this is most more easily done if you, if you take your space, special sections to be tori instead of Rn. Uh, because then you can just use uh, Fourier analysis with a discrete set of, of modes. You can plug uh, this into the wave equation. You get an ODE for, for each mode, which you can solve. So this problem is simple enough that you can solve this ODE in many, uh, in many cases. And so here are some examples. Uh, so if you take your scale factor to be a power of t, you have two cases. P may be smaller than one, or it may be bigger than one. If it is smaller than one, then uh, the, this integral here uh, diverges, and therefore you do not have a space like scry. If P is bigger than one, then this integral converges, and you do have a space like scry. So these are two. We expect these to be two different, very different situations. And indeed, if you solve the ODE for the, for the mode coefficients, you find that for P smaller than one, uh, your, your modes uh, decay. So your modes go to zero according to, to, to this uh, power of T. Also the derivatives of the modes also go to zero. Uh, if P is bigger than one, then the modes do not go to zero. In fact, the modes are, are asymptotically behave like a constant plus a decaying term. And of course, this constant will be the Fourier coefficient of the limit function that's crying. That's, that's the idea. So this, this is the situation when the scale factor is a power of t. Uh, you also have another example. You can take the scale factor to be an exponential. And in this case, you get a very similar behavior to, to the one you get for t to the p with p bigger than one. So this is, of course, uh, the De Sitter solution. So in the De Sitter, in the spatially flat De Sitter solution, your wave function is going to approach also uh, a function on scry. Uh, notice that uh, if, if scry is space-like, uh, then dispersion does not matter in the sense that uh, what, what goes on on scry depends only on, on a on a compact region of the initial data. So it doesn't really matter what the initial data is doing outside this region. It doesn't matter if your initial data is decaying or not decaying. So even in the case when you take your, uh, your spatial sections to be Rn, you can always pretend that you're in a torus because this is, this is local. So the, the, the behavior at scry does not care about how your initial data decays in Rn. So this behavior given by the modes is actually the behavior that you get uh, even if your uh, spatial sections are, are n. Okay, so this is one way of dealing with uh, the case that when you have a space-like scry, 
uh, sorry about this. <laughs> what about when you don't have uh, a space like Scry? So what about the case t to the p with p smaller than one, let's say? Well, here yeah, you can get a hint of what's going on by using this, this operator trick that is, so this was used for the first time by Kleinerman and Sarnak. Uh, and they, they, although they, they don't quite phrase it like this, this is what they actually did. So this is a paper from the 80s, I guess. Uh, so the idea is the following. So you take the wave equation in your uh, cosmological space time uh, and you, you write it out using the conformal time. And you, it's very easy to see that you get this equation is just like the wave equation in Minkowski, except that you have this annoying term over, over here. And so their idea is that, so suppose that you have an operator, O, that, that when you commute it with, with the, the time derivatives in the wave equation, it actually, so the, 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 the time derivatives uh, pass through the operator to give you a second derivative with respect to tau. Okay, if such an operator exists, and also if this operator commutes with the Laplacian, then uh, uh, you get the Minkowski wave equation for this new function, the operator acting on phi. Okay, of course, because so if you imagine applying O to both sides, so O commutes with Laplacian, so it goes to the right hand side, you get this. And when you commute it with these time derivatives, you just get the second time derivative. Uh, of course, <laughs> it's very rare that you get this operator. So almost always this operator does not exist. But the point is that it does exist in certain space times. Uh, for instance, let's let's set n to three because it's it's the physical case. And just to make uh, the calculation simpler, in this case, and if you fix uh, this scale factor t to the two thirds, which corresponds to a, a dust field cosmological model then this is the operator that you should take. And this is the operator that actually Kleinerman and Sarnak used. Uh, and so if you have this, uh, then you, you can turn the wave equation in the cosmological model into the wave equation in Minkowski. In Minkowski, you have the, the spherical means formula. So you have an explicit formula for the solutions of the wave equation that you can then integrate to get an explicit formula for solutions of the wave equation in this cosmological space time. Okay. Notice that this is the ca case t to the p with p smaller than one. So this you can use this to 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 try to understand what's going on, uh, at least in, in this particular case, for this particular value of p. And what you find once you do some simple calculations to to bound this this thing and, and change back the conformal time to the to the physical time, you find that the wave equation, the, the solution to the wave equation decays with one over t, which, as you recall, is the same decay as you get in Minkowski. And so this, this was the, 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 the operator. So this was the example that, that Feynman and Sarnak used. But actually, you can find these operators in other cases. So this one is obviously true, right? In, if you're in Minkowski, then of course, you can take O to be one. But more, more, more interestingly, you can do it for, for t to the one, one half. That's the radiation field cosmological model. Um, and this is not surprising because uh, in this case, for this space time, the, the scalar curvature is zero. And so the wave equation is a conformally invariant wave equation. So it's, it's natural that you can do it. Uh, also, you can also do it for the flat placeter uh, solution. So in all these three cases, uh, notably the last two, you have explicit formulas for the solutions to the wave equation. Uh, and so you, you can ask, so, okay, so this is another example of t to the p with p smaller than one. Uh, what do you get in this case for the dk? And what you, you do get is again, one over t. Okay, which is, which is quite quite interesting, right? You're, you seem to be getting, so you have three cases now. When you get one over t, you have Minkowski, you have radiation and you have the dust. Model. And in fact, if, if you look back to the modes, um, uh, you notice that as if, if you take p uh, close to one, and recall n is three, then you also get it 
for let's say a to the t equals t to the power one. So what's going on here? Uh, well, as, as I showed you, uh, well, maybe I should show it again. <laughs> it was too fast. So for, for, for the Fourier modes, from the Fourier modes, what you expect when n is three is that the decay would be t to the minus p. But the Fourier modes do not see the dispersion. They only see the, the local behavior. So they only see the redshift that's coming from the cosmological expansion. So what's going on here is that uh, for a given value of p, you have two effects. You have the redshift that is coming from the cosmological expansion, and you have dispersion that's coming from your initial data decaying at infinity, okay? So as you increase p, the redshift increases. So you can see this from the Fourier modes, your function starts decaying faster. Uh, but on the other hand, dispersion becomes harder because in a way, space is running away from you. So you, the wave tries to disperse, but the spatial section is expanding. So it's moving away from, you know, in a way from, from, uh, from the wave function. Uh, and therefore, as you increase P, the redshift helps more, but dispersion becomes harder. And it seems by these examples that the two effects are exactly compensating so that you always get this decay. Um, and so this is our conjecture. So if you take A of T to be T to the P with P smaller than one, then your DK will be one over T. It's not a theorem yet, but it's hopefully it will be in, in a, I'd say two months. <laughs> okay, and that, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zaya. Nice talk. Uh, so we have time for a fast question. Is there any question? I know exactly how this works. Or can the participants? I, I probably should stop sharing. I don't know if the participants can unmute themselves and raise questions or ask questions, or they have to use the Q and A. Oh, George, George well, has a we, question. Yeah, <laughs> we can raise. We can raise our hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, two questions. One is pretty obvious. What happens in the De Sitter case, which you didn't say? The other one is, can you construct this operator that you need for commuting with the uh, differential operators, uh, even if you have interpolative behavior? So if you go outside of simple power laws? Uh, so first question, so the De Sitter behavior, you can see it by the modes because it, you have a space-like scribe. So, and what happens, so this was actually done with Zhuang and our PhD student. Uh, what happens is that the, the solution approaches a function and the, the, the rate of, of convergence is exponential. It's e to the minus two t basically. And you can, it, you can also see it from the exact expression if you want, but you can also see it from the modes. And of course, this operator, I mean, this is a very flimsy, I mean, it, it, sometimes you can get it, but it's very rare that you can get it. So uh, the way we do it is we, we try out what, what about if it's this, if it's that, and sometimes it works. We don't have any idea why sometimes it works or not. Uh, I don't know how Kleinerman and Sarnak came up with this, to be honest. Um, but, but we have, one thing I'll say is that we, we can do also the, do this for, spherical sections and hyperbolic sections. Uh, and so we have also exact formulas for, I don't know, the, the for this sort of hyperbolic the Sitter model and so on. Um, so for the dust models also. So I should say Planum and Sarnak also did it for the hyperbolic dust model, not only for the fun. Uh, and you can you can find these operators in, in certain cases, but but uh, it's a I mean if you give me the AF AFT, I can try to find it, but most likely I will not be able to find it. Okay, uh, thanks. So we have to move to the next speaker. So the next speaker, speaker is Rita Teixeira da Costa. Uh, she's a PhD student, almost finishing a PhD uh, supervised by, by Michal da Fermos at Cambridge. She's a rising star in the mathematical relativity community and beyond. Her work on, on the Kolsky equation has been praised 
but she also found time to work on other problems. And a physicist has worked on a lot of different aspects of both classical and quantum uh, gravity. Uh, he is the first, I have to say this, the first laureate with uh, some years ago, I don't remember the exact date I should forget, uh, of the uh, Alberto Prize, which is the prize that the Portuguese Society for Relativity and Gravitation awards. Uh, and also close to me is young, I'm very happy and because he's recently joined our mathematical department. And we're very happy with that. And so, uh, George, whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> or yours. Thanks. I, I think I'm ready. Do you confirm I'm ready? Yes, I confirm that <laughs> your slides and the sound, everything is great. Okay, excellent. Um, well, uh, I would like to thank you, our chairman, uh, João Costa, for, for the very kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and so this talk will shift a bit the focus. I mean, we will move from cosmology into black holes, more or less. And I would like to talk to you today about critical collapse. Um, this, so despite the pandemics and, and all the you know, the, the critical situation that we are all living and we are all about to collapse. This is not about that. Uh, it's about critical collapse in uh, GR, in general relativity, and extensions of that theory, which we all know and love. Uh, this talk is based mainly on two papers, uh, not so recent, but not so old either, with uh, two PhD students, Maria Tomasevich and Pedro Aniceto. And I would like to, I would like to skip my slides, but I'm not able to. Last time I gave a seminar, I had this, the exact same problem. Okay, now it's working. Good. So what is, uh, well, the first thing I need to tell you about is what is critical collapse? So this is not an entire, George, I'm, not I'm not sharing. sharing. Not, no, no, I'm not sharing. Not, no. see if this works. I was having trouble sharing and um, changing the slides, which when we tested it before was not a problem. Okay, now you see me? Yeah, yeah, it's changing. Okay, good, yeah. good. okay so critical collapse is an entire field of general relativity. Um, it's about, well, gravitational collapse uh, in a very special setting. So typically when you collapse, when you take a body, a physical body, and you let gravity act on it, um, typically you end up with, say, a star, if there are other forces that counteract gravity. Um, you can get full dispersal uh, of your matter fields to infinity, and you're left with basically empty space. Or uh, you can get the formation of a black hole, so the formation of an apparent horizon. It's really what characterizes a black hole. Now, in between these two behaviors, which will be what I'm interested in, you get a special uh, case, which is where all the interest in dynamics lies at, uh, which is the formation of a zero size black hole, essentially. So there is still a singularity typically inside the black hole. So curvature blows up but it is not covered or it is marginally covered by an event horizon. So we call those things naked singularities. And we know for sure that you can get these, but it typically requires extremely fine-tuned initial data to get them. So the study of the appearance of these solutions and nearby solutions is what critical collapse is concerned with. So this has been a topic studied since the 90s, um, first by, by Matt Chopwick and upon suggestion and a lot of work by Christo Dulo. And since then, many other people uh, contributed and I cannot uh, acknowledge them all, of course, but here are a few names. Let me state already the, the main features. Um, there are three. 
First, that's the critical solution, which is the one that arises at the threshold, so the creation of a naked singularity, is universal, meaning that it doesn't depend on the specific initial condition that you choose. The, uh, the, yeah, you, you, you imagine you have a family of initial data uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't depend exactly on the initial uh, data as long as you fine tune it for, for some parameter to get the, the, the critical solution. Second main feature is that you get the appearance of a power law for the behavior of the mass of the black hole that you form as you, you vary the parameter that defines for you the initial data. So P star here is the critical parameter for which you get a zero mass black hole. If you are uh, super critical, you form a black hole. If you are under critical, you don't form anything. You matter just dispersed to, in, to infinity. But this power law is controlled by an exponent, which is called a critical exponent, gamma. And that exponent is also universal. And the third property, which is the most mysterious one is the uh, emergence of self-similarity uh, at the threshold solution. So here's a heuristic picture that I took from uh, Carson Gundlach's review, which I find is very nice. So you imagine a, a space of solutions and you select this line here, which is supposed to represent a one parameter family of initial data. And you let your system, here I'm still considering just GR, you let it evolve in time and see where it leads to you. Um, now you can imagine um, a surface here separating between one side where, in which you form a black hole and the opposite side in which you just disperse and are left with empty space. In between these two situations, you get the critical solution which, which ends at a fixed point, a saddle point. And all the universal properties that I mentioned before are a consequence of this picture, meaning that if this saddle point is an attractor in this uh, surface here and has only one unstable mode, whether you end up uh, as a with a black hole or in flat space, your solution is completely controlled by this growing mode. So if you end up here, it looks like if you fine tune your initial data, it looks like you, the solution came from that point. It doesn't really matter what initial data you chose. So that's the origin of all the universality properties. Now the, the other mysterious bit of this story is the self-similarity and it will remain mysterious in this talk. I will not <laughs> shed any light on that. Uh, but so there's no cl clear picture why uh, self, uh, why critical solutions should be self-similar, but it's a fact, it's an observation, uh, an empirical observation that they are, typically. Anyway, uh, self-similarity arises in all sorts of fields, in nature, in mathematics, even in finance. It's curious that the income of CEOs of very big companies has some scaling symmetry. It's curious and troubling also. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to distinguish between two different kinds of self-similarity. Discrete one, which is very well exemplified by this uh, Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot set, and the continuous type, uh, which is really a scaling uh, symmetry. So um, it, this is represented here in this figure by, by the, the, the apex of a comb, for example. Although the studies of Chopwick concern discrete self-similarity, that's what was observed, and in the system he studied. The continuous type is much simpler to, to, to study, and I will focus on those only. So this was actually done a while ago by, by Brady and Christodoulou as well. So they studied GR coupled to a scalar field, a mass of scalar field. This is, these are the, the equations of motions that you get. And the assumption, which was imposed by hand, so the assumption of continuous self-similarity translates into, well, the existence of a vector field uh, under which the metric uh, transforms up to a scale. So the lead derivative of the metric is proportional to the metric itself. 
Now you can work out what that tells, uh, what that implies for how the scalar field transforms under this vector field. And it turns out that the lead, the lead derivative of the scalar field must be just a constant, which they called kappa or minus kappa. So this is what you get from uh, the conjugation of this assumption and the equation of motion, essentially. But something nice that these people realized back in 94 was that this system of equations can be recast as an autonomous system. You have to do a lot of uh, field redefinitions, but in the end you get an autonomous dynamical system, which is excellent if you want to study uh, the behavior of the system. So they moved on to study and this, this is the picture that, well, Brady got. I'll have to explain what this means and then I'll generalize this picture. So first, uh, there are a few fields in the story. Uh, there's only really two fields and uh, you can think of them uh, as the GTT component of the metric and the GTR component of the metric, essentially. That's everything you have. Uh, and this plot shows these two quantities in the two axes of the plot. Uh, and you only really get, well, real solutions, which are the only ones we are interested in the shaded areas here. Okay. Then you want, uh, what, 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 what these orbits show are, each orbit is a different solution, okay? And you get a one parameter family of different solutions. Now you are only interested in solutions that are regular at the origin at least I am, and they were as well. So that imposes certain conditions, and the condition in, in translated in this picture is that the orbit starts at that corner over there. Okay, so this is the only orbit that we, we, we really care about. And it ends up at that corner there, where actually the, the dynamical system, well, the function that defines the dynamical system, system is not continuous. So uniqueness, of the solution is not guaranteed at that point. And indeed, there you get a one family parameter of continuations. Now, what does black hole formation mean in terms of this picture? Uh, well, it's a long story, but the, the conclusion is that the, the solution has to approach this point here. So all the orbits that end up there mean that they form an apparent horizon. Instead, all the orbits that go up here, they form naked singularities. So these are not exactly dispersal to infinity and leaving a uh, flat space. Instead, there are two different situations. Either you form a black hole or you form a naked singularity. It's not quite what Choptic observed, but also well, Choptic didn't observe continuous self-similarity. In between these two types of solutions, you get a critical solution which ends up at this saddle point. And it is well known in the literature that linearization of, around the saddle point um, gives you precisely the chop width exponent. So if we have all this analytic control on the system, we can compute exactly the chop width exponent in this setting, which is admittedly not the, set, the, the same setting as chop width study. So we were interested in studying what happens when you include gauge fields like electromagnetism. Uh, and well, the, our motivation was that in string theory or low energy effective string theories, uh, the actions typically arise with gravity coupled to scalar fields and gauge fields as well. So we were concerned about this case. And this is the sort of action that you typically get. You see the same scalar field as before and now we are adding a gauge field, a field strength squared here, coupled with the scalar field phi through this kind of exponential coupling. This is the typical thing that you get in string theory. This number A here is, the, is called the dilaton coupling. Um, so what are our results? Well, we, we, we play exactly the same game. We assume continuous self-similarity. The first result, is about how do the matter fields transform? If they need to be consistent with the continuous self-similarity and with the equation of motion, what does that tell us? 
And this is what we find. The scalar field has to transform the same way as before. The field strength has to transform uh, very similarly as the, as, the, um, as the metric, but the constant appearing here is related to the kappa and the dilaton coupling here. So it depends on the theory. Um, well, then if you want to study the, the orbits in phase space, the story is a bit more complicated because you have one more field, the gauge field, so the phase space is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. Um, but the Maxwell field enters the equations only quadratically. And this is very important because once you linearize around the saddle point, if it enters only quadratically, there's no sign of the Maxwell field upon linearization. So uh, the inclusion of the Maxwell field doesn't change the Chopwick uh, uh, exponent, gamma. Okay, but another important thing is that the consistency of, of the Maxwell equations, which are part of the field equation, imposes that the dilaton coupling A, which is a parameter of the theory, and kappa, which is a choice of how the scalar field transforms, they are not independent. They must be fixed by this relation. So in the end, there's a, there's a long story here in between, but what you get for the critical exponent is some formula, and this is precisely the formula, telling you what is the critical exponent given the dilaton parameter, the dilaton coupling A. And well, here's a plot of the, the phase space. Uh, it, will it would take a long time to, to describe this, but you can see very, very similarities with the 2D plot that I showed you before. One last thing before closing is that is the following. So the, the previous picture um, actually showed you that the critical solution must have zero um, electric field. Okay. So we were concerned uh, what happens if we want to impose a non-vanishing electric field. How can we do that? Well, a way to do that is to add uh, matter in the form of, well, this, the easiest choice that we could think of was the form of a charged null fluid. And for the aficionados of uh, Penrose diagrams, this is the picture that you get. Depending on initial conditions, you get either the formation of a naked singularity here, the formation of a black hole here, and in the threshold, in the critical situation, a formation of a null singularity, which corresponds to, uh, let me see, these orbits up here, those orbits down there and that critical orbit there. And you get a corresponding precise formula for the critical exponent, which I realize now I didn't show. So I think I'll leave you with the, the take home message here. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions if there's time for that and uh, mention some open problems as well, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, George, a very nice talk. Uh, so we do have time for a quick question, anyone? Have a question? I guess you can use the Q and A or the chat. Not so interactive. This system. Um, if not, let me ask you one question. So, you, you get an analytic. You, you get a, a formula for the critical exponent. That's not very typical, right? Or uh, yeah, we can. So exactly, we could only get it because we were in such a simple setting that you could recast the whole system as an autonomous system and use dynamical systems techniques to study it. Typically, so the, the, exactly. Sorry. Typically, one has to proceed numerically and fit. Oh, that's that's very results. interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. And also, but when a goes to zero, so the coupling goes to zero, you get. Aha! Excellent. It seems like problematic, right? Yeah. Uh, but notice that you cannot. You ah, cannot okay. take uh, the coupling A to okay. zero, still yeah. satisfying this condition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good, good. So thanks, thanks once again, George. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the, our final speaker, which is Mihalis Afermus. Uh, so Mihalis is, is a leading figure in, mathemat in mathematics and in mathematical relativity in particular for the last, I guess, 15 years or so. Uh, he's a famous, for, for his work on cosmic censorship and black hole stability. Also, very importantly, I should mention is that 
it was very uh, crucial in in bringing uh, the study of Einstein's equations and mathematical relativity from a somewhat obscure region of mathematics to uh, I guess to the to the uh, to the main field of, of mathematics. So I guess people now talk about Einstein's equations as they talk about Navier Stokes or Schrodinger. And, and it has a lot to do with his, with his work, with his political work as well, and <laughs> spreading the word. Uh, finally, I, I, he was the, the, the first person I thought for, for this position because also he has been a, a very good friend of the Portuguese uh, mathematical relativity community, with, uh, has made several visits to, to, to Lisbon and uh, has always been very encouraging and gave us a lot of, a lot of advice. And so I couldn't think of anyone else better to fit this, this, the ending of this session. And so thank you so very much for accepting the invitation. Mihalis, the floor is yours. So thanks uh, for that. I can't possibly <laughs> credit for uh, a lot of what you attributed to me, but I, I, I certainly, um, really, really have enjoyed my many visits to Lisbon. It's really one of the best places now in the world for, for this subject. And, and it's always been very stimulating for me. And so it's, it's really an honor to, to, to speak at, at this very nice event. So let me try to share my screen. Um, let's see if I am successful. Uh, okay. And let me uh, warn you that it's um, surprisingly, it's, it's raining here in Cambridge. And uh, <laughs> just 20 minutes ago, I had a little problem with the internet. Hopefully uh, that will not happen again during this talk. So, um, so right, the title of my, my talk is The Nonlinear Stability of Black Holes. And I'll try to um, sort of explain the current state of the art in, in the subject, in particular, the, the main result that, that I'll discuss is recent uh, joint work uh, with Gustav Holtzegel, Igor Rodniansky, and, and Martin Taylor, which is available at the preprint, which is listed here. Okay, so let me give you a quick uh, outline of the plan for, for the lecture. So first I'll formulate the full problem of nonlinear stability of, of the Kerr family. Uh, then I'll state the sort of current state of the art as far as completed work is concerned, which is the nonlinear stability of, of Schwarzschild without symmetry. This is this, this result um, that I just mentioned. I'll try to uh, give you an impressionistic uh, view of the, of the proof or the components that, that go into the proof, and then I'll end with, a, with an outlook. So, so off we go. Let me uh, begin with... Uh, just the formulation of the, the full problem of nonlinear stability of, of the Kerr family. And it is exactly um, um, uh, what you think it is. So uh, the, the problem is to show that the, the, the Kerr family of solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation is asymptotically stable in the black hole exterior for the full sub-extremal range uh, of parameters. So, so what does that mean? So again, it means exactly what you think it should mean. It means that space times arising from initial data, vacuum initial data, which is suitably close to a sub-extremal uh, curve metric. And uh, in, in this problem, you might as well start uh, not from space-like initial data, but from characteristic initial data. It turns out that on the basis of, of previous work, in particular on the basis of the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space, which I'll mention later, um, you can reduce the, the, the standard space-like Cauchy problem to this um, characteristic initial value problem. So space-time starting from such characteristic initial data, they should have the following properties. So one, they should possess a, a complete future null infinity. Okay? And, and, and moreover, the, the past of um, this null infinity, so this is this region here, should be bounded to the future by a smooth, complete event horizon. So that's what's depicted here. And this is exactly the, the, the statement that, well, that there's a black hole region, which is the, the part which is beyond the event horizon, but uh, sort of uh, there's also an exterior of the black hole and this exterior is in some sense as, as good as can. So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this problem. Um, so property two is the, uh, 
the, the statement that the metric in this region in the, in the exterior remains globally close to uh, the original uh, Kerr metric, which you perturbed initially. And the final, if you want, statement is that moreover, the, the metric in this exterior region should asymptote back to a member of the Kerr family. And in general, this member of the Kerr family will be a different member from, from the one which you thought you were perturbed. And when we say asymptote, for those of you who know about Penrose diagrams, which I suspect is most people in this audience, that, that means asymptoting as you go in, in, in this direction here. So if you want to, to, to give some names to these statements, uh, you can think of this first statement as the statement that we cosmic censorship holds in the neighborhood of Kerr. So if you look at uh, perturbations of Kerr initial data, then whatever happens, maybe there's singularities sort of here in the black hole region, but they are in the black hole region. Okay? In particular, there's still a complete future null infinity. Okay? Um, so to say another way, as asymptotic observers uh, live forever. So that's really weak cosmic censorship. So this first statement is, is the, the statement that you know, that's true in a neighborhood of Kerr. Uh, the second statement uh, that the, the solution remains close to the Kerr family um, in, in the exterior, you can think of this as the statement of orbital stability of Kerr. And the final statement that you asymptote back to another member of the Kerr family, you can think of this as the statement asymptotic stability of Kerr. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is that these three statements really come as a package. There is no route to proving uh, just one, let's say, without proving at the same time this, and in fact, without proving at the same time that. Okay? So this is just a fact of life of nonlinear analysis. Uh, these, these come as a package, and that's why uh, one of the reasons why this is a difficult problem. Okay, so this is, so this is the, uh, the problem. And so let me tell you the, the main result of this talk, which is the nonlinear stability of, of Schwarzschild without symmetry. So basically the, the theorem is that uh, what I said uh, is true if you replace Kerr with Schwarzschild. That's to say that the Schwarzschild family is asymptotically stable in, in, in the black hole exterior, um, except that you, you might say, wait a minute, how can the Schwarzschild family be asymptotically stable? After all, I can perturb ever so slightly Schwarzschild initial data into the Kerr family. And then, well, those are stationary solutions. So in particular, those will not asymptote back to the Schwarzschild metric. So, so in what sense could uh, the Schwarzschild family be asymptotically stable? Well, so the theorem is basically that uh, uh, you have asymptotic stability modulo precisely such perturbations, okay? So to say it um, uh, slightly more formally, so the Schwarzschild family is asymptotically stable in the exterior for the full expected set of perturbations. And what is that expected set? It is a co-dimension three submanifold of the moduli space of vacuum initial data set. Okay. So, so the statement is that for all um, characteristic initial data lying on such a co-dimension three submanifold of moduli space, uh, the analogs of one, two, and three hold. So again, uh, the uh, arising space-time possesses a complete future null infinity whose past is bounded to uh, the future by a regular um, complete event horizon. Um, two, the, the solution remains globally close to the original Schwarzschild metric. Uh, and three, uh, the solution asymptotes back to another member of the Schwarzschild family as a suitable uh, notion of time goes to infinity. And again, as I said before, basically in the Penrose diagram, that means as, as you move in, in this direction. And, uh, and uh, let me just remind you, this is all joint work with Holzegel, Rodniansky, and Martin Tate. So uh, just some, some, uh, some comments. Um, you might ask why co-dimension three and not co-dimension one? So uh, naively, you might think that uh, Schwarzschild is a one parameter. Uh, uh, or a co-dimension one subfamily of the Kerr family, shouldn't this be co-dimension one? Um, well, uh, I don't want to get into this at, at length, but actually when you smoothly parameterize the moduli space of solutions near Schwarzschild, because Schwarzschild is more symmetric than Kerr, then you, you actually have to sort of count the Kerr family more times, 
Okay, and this is sort of a well-known phenomenon in differential geometry. So, so actually, uh, sort of correctly seen, the the Schwarzschild family is actually co-dimension three. This is actually an important point if if you want to generalize this to the Kerr case and the various groups trying to do that now. And I'll maybe make a comment about that at the very end. Um, so, so this really is co-dimension three. And in fact, if if you are not on this co-dimension three submanifold, you will not asymptote to Schwarzschild. Okay, so this really is uh, uh, an if and only. All right, so, so that's the statement. And again, if uh, it's convenient to attach these sort of labels to the statement, so you should really think of the, the first statement as being the statement that weak cosmic censorship holds in the neighborhood of Schwarzschild, of course, subject to this uh, co-dimension three condition. The second uh, statement that orbital stability of Schwarzschild holds, and the third statement that asymptotic stability of Schwarzschild holds, all, of course, subject to, to, to this condition. So, um, okay. So uh, I'll, I'll maybe mention some of these things later, but let me already immediately uh, mention some, some previous work in order to put this result into uh, context. So actually the, the only previous um, result about nonlinear stability of asymptotically flat space times without symmetry really is the, the uh, in the vacuum case, is the nonlinear stability of, of Minkowski space. So um, the celebrated work of Christoph Lulu Kleinerman from 1990, of which there's several more recent uh, proofs. So, um, so as far as black hole stability problems in the nonlinear setting in asymptotically flat space times, uh, the only previous works uh, to date have been within symmetry classes. So that's to say that the data uh, and everything else has, has been um, uh, assumed to be symmetric. Okay. So, um, so in particular, there's the nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild for the Einstein scalar field system under spherical symmetry. Actually, in some sense, that's a, that's a much easier statement of the more general analysis that Christodoulou did uh, in his um, study of, of cosmic censorship for that model. And that was actually uh, tangentially referred to in the, in the previous talk. Um, and there's been uh, sort of other work on that model um, by other people. Um, I should say that in, 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 in the vacuum case, uh, of course, there, there's no non-trivial dynamics in, in spherical symmetry, but if you go to five-dimensional uh, vacuum, then uh, there's an analogous uh, symmetry that you can impose that again reduces the problem to one plus one dimension. And actually, uh, Gustav Holzegel in, in his PhD thesis, he showed the nonlinear stability for the five-dimensional Schwarzschild metric uh, under such a symmetry. And uh, finally, so the, the maybe the most difficult uh, result as far as uh, symmetric solutions concerned is a, is a more recent result of Kleinerman uh, Schiftel, where they considered the four-dimensional uh, Einstein vacuum equations under polarized axis symmetry. Okay, so this is a, a symmetry assumption, uh, which uh, in addition to axis symmetry assumes a, a polarization condition. And in this symmetric world, they uh, showed a version of the previous theorem in, in a recent uh, book, which, which you can see there. So this is sort of the, the, the previous uh, state of the art as far as asymptotically flat space times uh, are concerned. And maybe I should also mention the lambda greater than zero case. So, um, so in general, in this case, uh, stability problems are are easier because of exponential decay. This is something that, again, uh, came out in, in Jose's talk at, uh, at the beginning. Um, so in particular, in this setting, uh, nonlinear stability of, of De Sitter had been proven already by Friedrich in, in 1986. And uh, much more recently, there's the very impressive nonlinear stability for the very slowly rotating Kurt De Sitter case by uh, Hinz and Bass. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually try to uh, go back to, to non-zero cosmological constant in the end if, if I have time. So let me not say any more now about that. Okay, so, um, so that's the statement. That's the sort of uh, previous work. Let me uh, say a bit about uh, components of, of the proof. So, uh, so we all know that in order to do anything about uh, the Einstein equations, you have to you know, choose a gauge. So we, we, we saw this particular in, in, in Rita's talk just um, um, uh, just half an hour ago. 
So, uh, so in this problem, the gauge that we're going to choose is double null gauge. So what is double null gauge? Very quickly, double null gauge is, is, is the following. So um, in order to write the, the Einstein equations, we introduce the following geometric structure. So first we, we choose a, a sphere in our space time. Okay? And then, well, if we choose a sphere, then we can consider the, the boundary of the future of the sphere. And this has two components, which are null cones, okay? So you can think of this as a outgoing null cone and an ingoing null cone. And moreover, uh, since we're in the business of making choices, we can also choose a, a foliation of these two null cones by, by spheres, okay? So we can choose a foliation of this outgoing null cone by spheres, okay? And um, a foliation of this ingoing null cone by sphere. So lots of choices and that will come back to haunt us later, but whatever. So these are our, our choices. And once we've done this, this uniquely defines a double null foliation of, of, of space time, because now we can, we can consider the outgoing null cones emanating from these green spheres. And similarly, we can consider the ingoing null cones emanating from these red spheres. Okay. So this is a double null foliation of, of space-time. And um, we can think that naturally associated to this double null foliation, uh, there's, there's also something that you can think of as a, as a null frame. So I can consider at, at every point two null vectors, okay, which are tangent. Um, to the respective null cones. Of course, you also have to uh, decide on how exactly you, you want to normalize those, okay? And now uh, you can write the Einstein equations in the following uh, perverse way. So you can think the Einstein vacuum equations, reach equals zero, actually are the following. I look at the structure equations of differential geometry associated to these foliations, okay? So those are the, you know, the, the equations of submanifold theory where you plug in the, the fact that the ambient Ricci curvature equals zero. And I, I think of that uh, together with uh, the so-called uh, Yankee identities satisfied by the curvature tensor, which I can moreover, if I want, I can decompose with respect to this null frame. Okay. And it turns out that sort of those, that big set of equations forms a, a, a closed system which incorporates the sort of the uh, information in the Einstein equations. Okay, so, um, so that's what it means to write the Einstein equations in double null gauge. Let's take a look at what, what that looks like. Um, I don't know, you probably can't see these equations too, too uh, easily, but that's the whole point. I don't really want you to. Um, so, So uh, what, what do these equations look like? Maybe I'll just tell you a little bit. Maybe I'll try to zoom in. So on the one hand, you have transport equations. So these are part of the equations of differential geometry. Okay? So these look very ugly. Okay? So here are a bunch of transport equations. Um, you also have um, um, some elliptic equations on these spheres. These are also equations of differential geometry. So if you, if you know your differential geometry, the, the theorem I aggregium, uh, it follows from such a relation relating the, 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 the Gauss curvature of a, of a sphere to the ambient curvature, which in the Euclidean space is, 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 is zero and, um, and the second fundamental form. Okay, so you have some elliptic relations. And finally, you have the so-called Yankee identity. So these are what are written here. Okay, so these, these are the equations um, for the curvature tensor decomposed in, um, uh, in a null frame, okay? And again, uh, believe me, I, I don't expect you to follow up any of these uh, equations, but I just want to point out that in some sense, the hyperbolicity of the Einstein equations sits in this sort of uh, glorified generalization of the Maxwell equations, okay? So, so when you look at it like this, this seems like a very elaborate um, way of writing the, the, the Einstein equations. Um, but, but it turns out that it's a very geometric way of writing the Einstein equations. And in, in particular, if there is some intrinsic structure in your problem, 
you're guaranteed that you will see this structure in in this uh, sort of complicated formulation. Okay, so we'll 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 come back to the sort of merits of this way of writing Gaussian equation uh, uh, soon enough. Okay, so anyway, it is what it is. Let's put it out of sight and out of mind uh, for the time being. Uh, and so let me go on with components of the proof. So, okay, one thing we need to understand is we need to pick a gauge, which we think will be good. And the next thing that we certainly have to do is we have to understand the linear stability of our space time. Because we all know in nonlinear analysis that the only way to prove nonlinear stability is uh, if you know how to prove linear stability. Okay. So what about the linear stability of Schwarzschild? And this, this is a problem that goes back to uh, work in the mid fifties. In fact, uh, work by my academic uh, grandfather, Joni Wheeler. Um, and there've been many, many contributions sort of uh, over, over the years, but actually a, a, a full proof of linear stability of Schwarzschild was only uh, achieved more recently. And this was basically what um, our nonlinear result is based on. Um, and this is a, a, a joint work with Portugal and Rodnianski. Um, and here we proved uh, linear stability of Schwarzschild precisely in, in double null gauge. Okay. So let me uh, explain uh, what, what that means. So you take that awful system of equations that I showed you before and you linearize. Okay. So what does linearize mean? Well, it just means you, you, you introduce linearized quantities for all sort of geometric quantities and that in this Notation just means I, I put a one over all uh, uh, sort of notations. And from the right-hand side, so in the equations, I throw away uh, all uh, nonlinear terms, okay? So everything without a one is a background term. And then if you look at these equations, even if you don't understand anything, you, one thing you can read off is that they are linear, okay? So these are the, the linearized uh, equations in double null uh, gauge. And again, there, there, there are three pages of such equations. So here are the particular here are the, the, the linearized uh, yank yank things. Okay, so, um, so you consider the linearized equations and what we want to show, okay, is the following statement. This is the linear stability. Um, so you can think of these equations as, as being equations associated to a, a fixed Schwarzschild background. So here is the Penrose diagram, the fixed Schwarzschild background. Okay, here are uh, characteristic initial data hypersurfaces. And so the statement is all solutions to that awful system, linearized vacuum Einstein equations in double null gauge, okay, which arise from regular initial order, they remain uniformly bounded in this region. So that's the orbital stability, if you will, at the linearized level. And moreover, they decay inverse polynomially through a suitable foliation, okay, as you go, that's to say, towards this, this point in the Penrose diagram. Okay. But they decay to what? Well, they don't decay to zero. They decay to a standard linearized Kerr solution. Because of course, as we said at the very beginning, because the Schwarzschild family is a subfamily of the Kerr family, okay, you will see the um, Kerr solutions okay, in the linear theory around Schwarzschild okay, as a three-dimensional family of solutions. Okay. So, so you already see that here at the linear level. But I want to emphasize something very important that um, uh, B is only true after adding what one can call a, a residual pure gauge solution, which itself can be estimated by the size of the dot. So I, I'm gonna explain this, the significance of this fact and what it means later on in the talk. So, so this is sort of the, the, the linear version of, of, of the theorem. And this was sort of fundamental for, for, for showing the nonlinear stability. Okay, so, um, so let me just say as an aside that uh, subsequent to, to our work, uh, linear stability has been shown in other gauges. And one very important gauge to look at for obvious reasons is harmonic gauge or generalized harmonic gauge. And in fact, a similar result in such a gauge was shown by uh, Tom Johnson in, in his thesis at, at, at Imperial. So that's uh, this paper here. Uh, this is the statement of, of his theorem. And there's actually been uh, 
follow-up work about uh, linear stability in, in harmonic age by various other people, including uh, most recently by Hefner, Hintz, and Vasi, uh, which you can think of as a generalization of this work of Johnson to the very slowly rotating curtains. So, uh, so how does the, the, the proof of, of, of linear stability go? Well, in some sense, there, there, there are two steps, um, step one and step two. And step one is uh, concerns what I'll call the, the, the gauge invariant quantities. So what I'm showing you here is precisely the, the uh, Bianchi uh, identities, which, as I said, in double null gauge, you can think of as um, corresponding to the hyperbolic part of the action. Okay. So again, this is sort of the glorified generalization of, of the Maxwell equations. Okay. So you can really think of this as something analogous to the, the Maxwell equations decomposed in the null frame, except that because it's a higher spin, uh, there are sort of there are more equations than when you write the Maxwell equations. Okay. So the point is that sitting in this system are, are two fundamental quantities, which are sometimes in, um, uh, which, you can think of these as the extremal curvature components. So they're the curvature components that take uh, as many null vectors in the same direction as possible. Okay. And so, so these um, uh, curvature components, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Newman Penrose formalism, these are typically called in that formalism uh, C0 and C4. But in this notation, they're called alpha and alpha bar or sometimes alpha plus two and alpha minus two, okay? Um, so, so these components remarkably, um, uh, they decouple from the full system and they, they satisfy uh, an equation which is known as the Tukolsky equation. So this was discovered long time ago by, by uh, Tukolsky. In fact, this is true in the Kerr case. So I've written here the decoupled equation which, which these quantities satisfy in, in, in the Kerr case. So uh, in the Schwarzschild case, you just have to set um, this A to zero. So this slightly simplifies. Um, so, so the nice thing about this decoupling is that you can understand completely these quantities just by understanding this equation. Um, and this equation, okay, this part of the equation is, is familiar. This is just the wave operate applied to alpha. So here S is, is plus two or, or minus two. So this is just the, the, the wave operator. But what you'll see here is that there are all these uh, nasty uh, first order terms. And it turns out that even though there's been a lot of progress in the last years of understanding the, just the wave equation, okay, so the case when you set S equals zero here, okay, um, that progress sort of exploits the Lagrangian structure of the wave equation. And these uh, first order terms, uh, they break that structure. And uh, there is no sense in which you can think of this as a small perturbation of, of the wave operator. So sort of for the issues that are important, these, these sort of first order terms are in some sense large. So, um, so that, was a, that was a difficulty for, for a long time, but, um, but it turns out that uh, one can um, understand uh, uh, sort of decay for um, uh, this equation. And uh, the way to do that is, is actually to exploit a, a way of somehow transforming this equation to another equation, which is much better, namely the Reggie Wheeler equation. So, um, so this is what, this is sort of step one of, of, of our work. Um, and uh, we were able essentially to exploit a transformation similar to things that had been considered in the physics literature by uh, Chandra Sekhar already in the in the 70s and 80s, reinterpreting this in, in physical space and sort of using it accordingly. So, so that was sort of step one. Um, and actually this step uh, generalizes uh, to Kerr. So it was generalized to the very slowly rotating Kerr case um, in a different paper with, with Holzegel and Rodniansky and also independently in, in work of Ma. And um, uh, much more recently, it has been uh, generalized to the full subextremal case by uh, Schlappentoff Rothman and, and Rita Teixeira, who just spoke. So, um, so actually this part of, of the analysis now has been done uh, in, in the Kerr case in the full subextremal range. And I'll, I'll return to this when I talk about the outlook for the future, because this really, in some sense, was the, the last remaining stumbling block 
for understanding uh, this problem in, in the current case. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll mention that there's also further work based on this by various other people, but in the interest of time, I, I, I can't speak more about that. So, so that's step one. Uh, now step two is going from Tukolsky, going from this gauge invariant quantity to, to the full system of equations. And here, what, what, what you uh, exploit is a hierarchical structure in this very ugly system. So just to give you an idea, okay, I've circled here uh, some equations in this system. So what, what, what are these equations? So these are equations actually for the shear of the uh, ingoing null cones. So that's what this funny expression is, okay? And whatever this equation is, this, you should think of it as a transport equation for the shear, okay? Um, where on the right-hand side of the equation, you see uh, precisely this extremal curvature component that you've already controlled because it satisfies the goals. So uh, the executive summary of how you understand these equations is you just estimate them as transport equations. You, you have estimates for the integral of this, okay? So you use this to try to estimate this. So, so the point is that indeed, given decay for these, these good quantities, you can indeed solve these equations as transport equations, and then you can move up the system hierarchically. Okay? So it turns out you can order the quantities in such a way so that at each step, on the, you have transport equations, and on the right-hand side, you have quantities that you've already estimated. So that's the remarkable uh, structural aspect of, of this system. But there's one caveat, which is the following. That specifically for this ingoing shear component that I talked about, this procedure doesn't give you decay for this quantity, it only gives you boundaries. And basically, okay, the reason is sort of clear that, well, if you integrate this quantity, okay, then generally the integral of this quantity is going to be something non-zero, okay? And that you can think of that as some sort of memory. So this, at future time is not going to be in general zero, which is what it would mean to have decay. All right, so I'm going to go back to this point later because this point is precisely related to the fact that you only have decay after adding a pure gauge solution, okay? But I'm gonna to return to this point when I talk about the null. So, um, so the last thing I want to mention is that, uh, as I said in the statement, you don't have decay to zero, you have uh, decay to uh, linearized Kerr solutions. And it turns out that the linearized Kerr solutions, you can work out explicitly, okay? So I've uh, worked them out uh, here. So these are the, if you want, the linearized Schwarzschild solutions, and these are the linearized um, fixed mass Kerr solutions, okay? So this is a one parameter family, and this is a three parameter family. But it turns out that these, uh, if you want, um, these solutions live in the um, L equals zero and one uh, modes of, of the system. And those modes decouple from the rest of the system. So as a result, you can actually read off the linearized uh, Kerr solution to which you will uh, asymptote. You can read this off from initial data. So you can look at your initial data and already at the level of initial data, you can read off um, the uh, linearized Kerr solution to which um, uh, you'll asymptote. So there's another way of saying the, the main linear result, which is the following. So uh, remember, the, the, let's go back to the statement. So, um, so the statement was that all solutions to the linearized vacuum Einstein equations around Schwarzschild arising from regular asymptotic initial data remain uniformly bound on the exterior and decay polynomially to a standard linearized curve solution. But you can actually uh, specialize the statement to the following. So uh, there exists a co-dimension three uh, submanifold of solutions, okay? such that uh, here I can replace linearized Kerr to linearized Schwarzschild. 
But the point is that in this linear theory, this co-dimension three submanifold is explicit. Okay. So you can read it off from initial data. Okay, so now this is the theorem. This is the theorem which we generalize to the full nonlinear theorem. Okay. So let, let me just say a few words about the nonlinear difficulties. So, um, so of course, this is the, the specter that haunts any um, sort of discussion of, of nonlinear stability problems in, in, in general relativity. Uh, the, the sort of difficult proof of the stability of um, Minkowski space. But in some sense, the, um, it's not too much of a stretch to say that the nonlinear stability problem of black holes does not introduce at the nonlinear level truly new difficulties that are not already present at, at, um, in the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space if you do the linear theory in the, in the right way. Okay. So, um, so let me um, uh, uh, make some comments. So, um, so in particular, because we've done the linear theory in double null gauge, double null gauge has the following good properties. One property was what we already exploited at the linear level, namely you can isolate the gauge invariant components. And once you have estimates for them, you can estimate everything else in, this, in the system hierarchically. But double null gauge has another great property at the nonlinear level, which is that it captures in a nice way the intrinsic null structure present in, in the Einstein vacuum equations. Okay? And this is something that we've seen in many problems uh, in general relativity where, where double null gauge has been successfully used by Stothulu, Kleinerman, Nicolò, Luke, Luke Rodniansky, and, and others. Okay? So, um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, very, again, impressionistically, what does, what does it mean that there's good null structure? So again, here, here is a, a collection of the system of, um, of the Einstein equations in double null gauge. Here, here are the Bianchi identities, okay? Which again, this is where the hyperbolicity of the system lives, okay? And it doesn't matter what any of this notation means. I just want to point out that, okay, these are nonlinear equations. What I've circled here is a nonlinear term. Okay, so this is a particular nonlinear interaction between a, a shear. So we've seen both of these components before. It's a nonlinear interaction between a shear and the curvature component. Okay, and here we have a wedge. And so the point here is that sort of this, this wedge, whatever it is, it's some geometric product. And geometric products respect sort of intrinsic null structure. Okay, so it's in this sense that the, the, the nonlinear terms, when you write things in double null gauge, because they're geometric, Okay. They respect that structure. So this is something that one loses, for instance, in harmonic gauge. And this is why when trying to prove already nonlinear stability of Minkowski space in harmonic gauge, you have to make do with much weaker manifestations of this sort of so-called null condition. So in double null gauge, one advantage that one has is that one knows ab initio that sort of that structure is well reflected. Okay. Um, so what are other issues? So another issue is the issue of teleology. Okay, so this is actually a, a linear issue and it's precisely the issue that I, I referred to very briefly before. Um, it just, it becomes even more complicated in, in this setting. Um, and, but, but I think it's maybe easier to understand in this nonlinear setting. So, uh, so what is the issue of, of teleology? So remember when we talked about double null gauge, I told you that double null gauge has a lot of choices. You choose a sphere, okay? You consider this cone, you consider this cone, and then you foliate these. And once you foliate these, okay, that uniquely defines a double null foliation of spacetime. Okay. But here's the problem. Okay. If you want in your double null foliation, the spacetime to settle down to some standard double null foliation of Schwarzschild curve, whatever the case may be. That's to say, you want this sphere here at very late times to be a standard sphere, okay? Well, it's unfortunately not gonna work because you see, this was very arbitrary. If you change the choice of this, you're gonna change the choice of that, okay? On the other hand, you know, uh, the precise position of this, okay? 
is uh, affected by the radiation flux that goes through here. Okay? And there's sort of memory which is locked in. This is precisely this notion that we saw at the linear level that you know, the, the shear of this null cone okay, is not going to decay to zero. Okay? This is not going to become round. Okay? Because you know, this is governed by a transport equation. So how do you make this round? Well, you turn this picture upside down. That's to say, um, when choosing the gauge, you don't start from some, from some sphere at initial data and from these cones. Okay? You erase this completely. And you start from a sphere in the future. And uh, because you're choosing a sphere at the future, you're not going to choose that sphere. You're going to choose the best sphere possible, which looks like this. So you choose this sphere. Okay? You choose these null cones. And you foliate these in some natural way. So you choose the gauge from the future. So this is teleology. Okay? And already at the linearized level, this is uh, essential. Okay? So anytime you use a sort of geometric gauge determined by transport equations, okay, the good news is there's a, there's a systematic way of going from gauge invariant components to gauge dependent components. The bad news is that in general, you, you do have to choose the gauge from the future. You don't want bad choices from the present to sort of be locked in. So, um, so this is sort of the uh, uh, fundamental aspect of the problem. And of course, in the nonlinear setting, because you, don't, you can't go all the way to the future uh, at the beginning of the problem, because everything is coupled to show the existence of the space-time, you need to solve the equations. You have to do this whole process in the context of a bootstrap. Okay. So that's, that's, that's complicated. And in fact, well, let me not go into more detail here, but you actually uh, require two distinct normalizations uh, to capture sort of correctly the geometry, both of the event horizon and of, of, of null infinity. Okay. So this is, this is a little bit complicated. Um, and in, in that same vein, uh, it turns out that, that several addition features become teleological in the nonlinear theory. Um, so remember in, in the linear theory, what I told you uh, at the very end, that you can read off the linearized Kerr solution to which you approach, you can read that off from initial data. Okay. So again, you can say, for instance, that there's a co-dimension three submanifold of initial data in the linear theory, such that you will go to linearized Schwarzschild, but you know what that co-dimension three submanifold is explicitly. In the nonlinear theory, uh, we again we want to identify that co-dimension three submanifold of the moduli space of initial data for which we'll approach Kerr, but you can no longer read it off explicitly. The only way to know if if initial data set is going to approach Schwarzschild is to evolve that initial data set. So the very co-dimension three subset of initial data that our theorem is about, you can only construct teleologically. So that actually sounds like a, a, a big difficulty, but actually since you already had to construct this gauge teleologically, and that's, that's sort of an infinitely, infinite co-dimension, if you want, uh, construction, it turns out that, that, that this is not so difficult to implement in, in practice. So, um, so even though this may, may seem quite daunting, uh, doing this, uh, given that you've already uh, teleologically constructed the gauge, is actually not so much worse. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so let me just say uh, very briefly that in particular, um, there are some subsets of the uh, of our stable submanifold that you can identify a priori. So in particular, if your initial delta is axisymmetric and has zero Comar angular momentum, then you know from Wald's textbook that uh, the only Kerr solution that this could possibly asymptote to is the Schwarzschild solution. Okay. And indeed, one can show by a direct argument that all those solutions live on our uh, uh, finite co-dimension submanifold. The difference is that, of course, these are now an infinite co-dimension subset of that uh, finite co-dimension submanifold, but those you can 
you can identify a priori. So, so this is a corollary of our work. So in particular, the, the polarized uh, axisymmetric uh, spacetimes are a further infinite uh, co-dimension submanifold of the axisymmetric uh, spacetimes with zero coma uh, angular momentum. So, um, so in particular, the, the set of perturbations considered in that book of Kleinem and Schiftel are, are such an infinite co-dimension uh, subset of the, the full stable manifold that we've constructed in our field. Okay, so um, very quickly, I'll, 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 I'll give the outlook for the future. Maybe I'll skip what I wanted to say about um, uh, non-zero cosmological constant. So, uh, so this was the, the open problem uh, that I started with, the, the full nonlinear stability of Kerr, uh, of the Kerr family in the, in the full sub-extremal range. Um, and um, I mentioned before the, the, the linear statement of um, uh, Schlappentoff, Rothman, and, and uh, Rita Teixeira, uh, that in some sense was the last stumbling block uh, at the conceptual uh, level for generalizing uh, our uh, nonlinear result here for uh, Schwarzschild to the, to the full uh, sub-extremal curve case. So, um, so given that recent result, I don't think there are any major conceptual issues in generalizing our result uh, to occur in the full uh, sub-extremal uh, case. Of course, it's still a formidable engineering uh, challenge to write a complete uh, self-contained readable proof. Uh, there are various uh, groups working on this uh, as we speak. Uh, so let me mention in particular, besides my own work with, with my collaborators, there's some work in progress of Georgie, Kleinerman, Shen, and Schiftel, uh, the latter restricted to the very slowly rotating. But uh, maybe I should end by saying that in, in my view, at, at this point from the sort of conceptual point of view, the most uh, interesting thing to understand is real, really the extremal case. So I've excluded the extremal case from the conjecture because we know um, a priori that the extremal case is, is more complicated in view of the um, Aritagis instability. Um, still, it, it, it may be that, that you know, there, is, um, uh, there is a stability uh, uh, problem to, to be proven. Actually, the extremal case has a sort of threshold uh, 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 property not, not, not dissimilar to the sort of the critical collapse which was discussed in, in, in the previous talk. So I, I really think that sort of the um, uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, frontier of, of, of the field in black hole stability problems is, is now very much uh, sort of on, in, in the subject of this uh, extremal case. And so there's a nice uh, paper actually of um, uh, Harvey Real and collaborators uh, concerning a strictly symmetric model problem of this. Uh, there's a recent uh, mode stability result in the extremal case due to, again, to uh, Rita Teixeira. And, and we also have a conjecture about the extremal case in, in, in our paper uh, that I mentioned. So, so in any case, if, if there are any students who want to work at the cutting edge of, of black hole stability, I think the extremal case now is really the, the cutting edge of the field. So, um, so this is a really uh, interesting direction. To go. Okay, so sorry for going a few minutes over. So let me just stop there. Thank you very much, Michal. It's a very, very nice talk. So let me see if we can get some questions out of this system. So are there any questions? Please either use the q and I guess, or the, the sh chats, uh, or just raise your hand. I, I don't know if I can see that. No, I think. Okay, so so I do have a couple of questions. So, uh, as you know, we share this this interest about the black hole interior, and uh, and the recent talk by Kleinerman, he was saying that the approach that they're taking with with uh, that you just mentioned, they don't get enough uh, decay apparently uh, along the event horizon to then apply your your result with look to to get the C zero stability of, of the Cauchy horizon. What happens in in, in in your case, in uh, in your result with well, of course, in, in so it, so our result is about Schwarzschild, and Schwarzschild is exactly the case 
in which you do not, um, you know, we, our, our, our result with Luke does not apply in the Schwarzschild case. Actually, one of the open problems that we pose in our, um, uh, in our um, paper, so it's another conjecture, I guess I didn't mention it here, that, but that we write explicitly in our paper, is, okay, to understand what, what happens in that case, in the interior, that's to say what happens in the black hole interior, uh, sort of if you have a vacuum space-time without symmetry that, that asymptotes to Schwarzschild on, on the event horizon. For instance, you might think that you can, you can show exactly the opposite of what we did in, in, with, with Jonathan, namely to, we, you can show that you know, there, there cannot be a Cauchy horizon from you know, whose Penrose diagram sort of, you know, uh, which in Penrose diagram corresponds to the, the curvature. So that would be very interesting. Uh, to be able uh, to show. So um, now, the, so our, our, our methods certainly in, in the Kerr case give you sufficient uh, decay in order to apply my results with, with, okay. with Luke. I, I mean, I would be surprised if um, one could not uh, uh, apply it on the basis of what um, Georgie, the Kleinerman, Shen, Sheftel are trying to do, but one will have to wait until they have a result uh, and then one will be able to see. But so, I, but I would be surprised if you could not um, uh, apply it, but okay, they will have to uh, complete what they're trying to do and then one can take a look. Okay, Let's see if this question showed up. It's not. So I was wondering also some more general questions. So there was a moment you didn't talk about the, the positive lambda case. You didn't have time. So there was a moment where this the the Fourier uh, analysis seemed to be giving very very nice results. And uh, so this is kind of debate between using space time methods versus frequency space methods. So what do you think is the status of this? I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's the important distinction, namely, um, I, I don't think the important distinction is between, um, uh, let's say, uh, Fourier space and physical space methods. I think the, the important, um, I mean, what, what, what is important in nonlinear theory is that you prove localized energy identities. I think that's, that's what's quite clear in, in I mean, that's, that's what's quite clear, that sort of localized energy identities is a very powerful tool to apply to nonlinear problems. I, I think that's sort of the thing that one should focus on. And in the context of proving localized energy identities, there's certainly a role for frequency space analysis that's been used um, a lot in um, in general in these problems and clearly, you know, has to be used, okay? And so, so if you look at, let's say, the, the work of, uh, of Rita here, uh, the recent work, I mean, they use a lot of frequency space analysis, but the final result is a localized uh, energy estimate. It's an energy estimate that you can localize in, in, in space time. I really think that that's that is the fundamental distinction. So, so it's not um, it's not a sort of distinction between using only uh, sort of physical space but never taking the Fourier transfer. I, I, that's not the distinction. And and this is exactly why, by the way, there is no um, real conceptual difficulty in implementing what we did. In Schwarzschild, in in the full subextremal case, given the linear analysis that's been done now by uh, by uh, Rita and by Schapenthal, uh, Rothman. I mean, the, the sort of using that analysis in the nonlinear case is not actually a problem because at the end of the day, what they have shown is is a localized energy estimate. So that I mean, I think that's sort of the that's the lesson that I draw. I mean, at least from from this now. You know, again, from using uh, sort of Fourier analysis or using uh, something which is not Fourier, you can also use the fundamental solution. Um, that's physical space, but it doesn't give you a localized energy estimate. 
I think that, that that's the that's the more important. Thing. So that's sort of more difficult to use. Um, you know, the original uh, results on um, uh, the results in Sergio Gleinerman's thesis on um, uh, nonlinear wave equations. Um, they were using the fundamental solution in order to sort of uh, estimate. This is physical space, but of course, you know, because it doesn't give you the type of energy estimate that you wanted, uh, you know, you couldn't get the, the sort of the result in, in the physical three plus one dimension. You were using, you know, Nash Moser and all sorts of things that you, know, you certainly would never want to be used. So, uh, so it's not really about, it's not the distinction I don't think is about between Fourier and, and, and sort of purely physical space things. It, it really is about showing localized energy. Systems. So, um, yeah, and anyway, so I, 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 I think from that point of view, um, the situation, the short should occur, it's not so different. It's not so different. Okay, so, so can, can I, you hear me? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry, my, I was trying to ask a question, but my oh, well, go on. So I, I was just wondering, uh, so you said that it's very hard to know a priori if you're on your co-dimension three um, submanifold or not from the initial data. But right. can you not can you not just compute the ADM angular momentum like the three components? But, no. So 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 the problem is precisely that that the 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 angular momentum of course is is conserved at spatial infinity, but it is not uh, conserved uh, along null infinity, and so. But, but what, what you're saying is exactly, in some sense, in the case of axisymmetry, and this is exactly, you know, why uh, if, if your data is axisymmetric, then you can identify whether it lives on the submanifold, because in axisymmetry, then there is no radiation of, uh, of um, angular momentum to null infinity. So in axisymmetry, that's exactly what happens. That sort of, you can look at the Comer uh, angular momentum, which is something that's actually quasi-local, you, know, you can define it. Anyway, you can you can you can compute it sort of on, on any sphere, but in particular, you can think of you can compute it at, at null infinity if you, if you want. Uh, if that's zero, uh, then it's always zero, right. and that tells you that that you know if this solution is stable. I mean, the only thing it could possibly uh, asymptote to if stable is um, uh, is short. -short. So, uh, so that's why axisymmetric data you can you can understand if it lies on this, uh, but of course this is an infinite uh, dimensional uh, subset because okay it's symmetric, um, uh, but the general uh, uh, you know unfortunately sort of for general initial data there's there's literally no way of uh, of computing this other than evolving, right. and so and uh, and of course to evolve you need to show stability so. You know this 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 identification of the submanifold is all happening in the context of the continuity. Right. Thanks. Okay. Are there any more questions? Check all this. If not, I guess it's time to, to finish this session. I would like to thank all the speakers. George had to leave for family reasons. Uh, I think it was a very very nice session. I'm very happy with it. With good number of participants and uh, so I guess it's just nice thank you all and I hope to see you face to face thank you in the future okay thank you okay. as well ciao Zé obrigado Rita thank you Michalis bye everybody bye bye